Hey, Ricardo. Hey, audience. The doctor is in. Um, I think Mo, Mo came in, but she must have had a little hospital emergency. So I'm sure she'll be back if she can make it. Um, but it's great to have you. And um, we have our new friend, Ricardo Johnson, the second on the on our Zoom with us. Here comes Mo right now. And um, we are going to talk about a very interesting topic tonight. Um, I'm going to give Mo a second to get in and get set up a little bit. But, um, but you know, it's a question. Hey, Mo. Hey, Mo, you here? Give her a second to check in, to get her sound going. You're here. Hey, Mo, can you hear us? Can't hear you. Are you on mute? How about now? There, I can hear you there. Great. And okay, we're here. I was steady talking. How are we doing? We're, we're doing great. The doctor is in. Now the doctor is brilliant. And we're I here with our, our, our new friend, Ricardo Johnson II, to talk about a very interesting topic. You know, I told him we don't often have men on our show. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and he actually came to us through Shavana because he wanted to talk about men being part of a woman's care team for breast cancer or cancer and just for her caregiving and you know it is caregiving month and so so this is your show ricardo let us hear your story like what's up with that because well thank you, know, you. We, we're like a girl thing you know and and we all take care of each other it's like a breasty love thing you know and so i think even when we have men in our lives we i don't know that we necessarily include them in the care yeah so it's a, it's i'm sorry go ahead I apologize. No, 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 absolutely. You first, please tell us everything. Well, I don't know if I can tell you everything. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure that I'll be able to tell you anything new. Um, but what I can tell you is a little bit about my experience. Um, I am uh, 30 years in healthcare. Um, and about uh, four years ago, um, I was dating someone pretty new um, who uh, had breast cancer. And uh, actually, in fact, she was um, she got the phone call to go into the doctor and uh, with me. And then we went in and she um, we found out that she had she had a breast cancer. Um, and, you know, I just being in healthcare, I thought, well, you know, I, I got this and um, I didn't. <laughs> and so I, I actually I, I, as I was talking with Ricky after we afterwards, I thought, well, let me kind of put down kind of five things that if I could go back and talk to me, I don't know if this will cross apply, um, but if I could go back and talk to Ricardo um, at the beginning of the, of the experience, um, these are the things that I wish I would have known. And I'll, I'll just kind of mention them and then we can kind of go through um, at your, at your leisure. But um, one was be present. Uh, two was communicate. Three is to have a plan. Uh, four is provide opportunities for intimacy. And then lastly, five was uh, have a, am I crazy, homie? You know, somebody you can call and say, is this me? Is it, you know, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so I, you know, I, again, I can, I can, you know, get into these or, you know, whatever you all, however you'd like to, yeah. to uh, progress. I love that because, you know, I, I gave a talk to my hospital support group uh, just Monday. And one of the women asked and said, can we do something for, uh, for men, for partners? And there's a term for it. You know, they call it co-survivors, right? Co can we do yeah. something for our co-survivors uh, to, to better help them? Because they don't know what to do. They don't know where to touch. They don't know how to be of help. And it seems like maybe the things they do might be, you know, irritating and, and, and not even, and, and maybe not through any fault of their own. But because of what a person's going through, they're not able to receive in the manner in which something was given. So I, I would love to go through these a little bit more and really do a deeper dive into them. So what was number one again? Being present. Um, huh. And what I wrote down was being present may mean being proactive. It may mean uh, being active. It may be uh, um, reactive or it may just simply mean being present. And, uh, you know, those uh, particularly for a type a type personalities like me, um, you know the this I got it, yeah, I got it, I got it, and there were so many times when one I didn't have it. I really sincerely, I just didn't get it, and I I thought we were over here doing this, 
and we were out there doing this, you know? And so like, so, what were those, what were those occasions? Like, what were the things that were disconnected? Well, there were times when, I mean, there, there, there are really lots of, but one of the things that I kept that I, that I, when I talk about being present was I would sense discomfort or tiredness or pain and I would want to involve myself in the mitigation of that experience. And then right. this is the fixers, it, right. They're fixers. Exactly. So you want to try to do something and fix exactly. it and make it go away and make it better. Exactly. How is that? How is it received? Well, what I learned later in the experience was it is very difficult for someone to tell you how to fix what's wrong when they themselves are processing what's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, hello, so, hello. You, you know, so, you know, I, I'm sitting here trying to involve myself in an experience that hasn't been quantified internally. And that is really, for me, it was difficult. And, and I would say frustrating. And I, I, one of the things that I, when I say communicate, that's the next one was that I'm communicating and she's communicating even when we're not talking. So mm. when I'm trying to, I want to fix it, I want to do this. And when I can't fix it, I'm mad mm -hmm. because this woman who's trying to stay alive won't let me help, <laughs> you know? And so that's, yeah. that was really one of the things that this kind of being present, being able to really understand that all I really need to do is make her aware that I am here to the extent that she does and does not need me. Um, and that what I have to do is, and that's really what, you know, we talk about communication and having a plan, all these things kind of build on each other. But the biggest thing was, is that, you know, really this is a, this is a situation where I cannot be the initiator that I am in every other part of my life. Maybe even that I would be in the traditional components of our relationship. Mm -hmm. In this particular instance, what I had to do is, as I said, just be present and then allow her um, the freedom to deal with what she's dealing with and then call upon me to whatever extent it is that she needs me. So, so I guess, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, okay. I, I was just going to say, you know, when you think about being present and you said it means, you know, learning when to be proactive or reactive or non-reactive, are there, are there clues and cues? How does one know when being present means doing nothing at all? Well, Monique, that, that is what the, the communication component comes in. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, what I'm doing, and, and this was a little, this was complicated by the fact that we had known each other that long. I think we'd been dating maybe two or three months. So we hadn't known each other that long oh, yeah. um, for me to be brand able new. to- Brand new, yeah. it, brand tough. new. Right, right. So I wasn't um, adroit at being able to understand nonverbal cues and those kind of things. Now, again, through the entirety of the experience, you begin to kind of understand that when this happens and this happens, do this. When this happens, do happens, do this. And, you know, kind of through trial and error. And it required a great deal of patience on her part, in addition to everything else she was dealing with. Um, but it was a situation where the 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 recognize, recognizing that she's telling you things when she's not saying things, she's telling you things when she's saying things, and that I am responding, whether I'm responding with my mouth or my eyebrows or you know I'm as you can see I'm an I'm an expressive man, and so uh, I I had to kind of check that too, which again goes back to being present. If I'm listening to her if I'm present for her, then I'm less focused on how I feel about that or what I want to do, or I'm not trying to anticipate these things. I'm just here listening. And then based on what I'm seeing, hearing and experiencing, reacting in a way that is consistent with what her needs are in that moment. Gotcha. You know what, Ricardo, it's interesting because, um, you know, most women are fix-it people. We're the fix-it people. You know what I mean? Like we're the ones that want to, the control, like I want to fix it especially if you're a mom or whatever, I think, and I think in that moment, she couldn't fix herself. Right. Like when I was sick, like I wanted to fix myself and I, it was hard to even welcome someone trying to help me because I was trying to process how to fix it myself. You know, like what, what am I doing to get, what do I have to do to get out of this? Right. 
And so I think you're so confused about your inability to fix yourself that you can't even hear anyone else trying to help. Like if you're not a doctor, I don't want to talk to you. Because what do you? I feel like women are indoctrinated to hold and save space for each other. Like we do these, these circles and gatherings and all kinds of, you know, sorts of things where culturally we're taught to give each other space to blank. Right. And it's, it's, especially as black women, it's becoming much more commonplace to say, you know what, I'm holding space for this. So I'm going to sit with you in this, whatever. And, you know, for, for men, it's not so much Is there, you know, there's, there's a, there's a problem. We must fix it. And that can, um, it can go over really poorly sometimes with, I see it in, in patients and, 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 you know, dynamics all the time where unfortunately the way the woman perceives it is that she's perceiving it as you're trying to gloss over or minimize what I'm going through, Amen. right? Because you're just trying to brush and get to the solution when you haven't even heard my problem yet, or you're trying to rush me through my process of X, Y, Z, or almost this sort of toxic positivity. We're going to get through this. We're going to fight. We're going to, and, and she's just like, I don't know the, the ceiling just fell on me. And I, I don't, I, you know, I'm still reeling from it. And, and I don't know that we, um, I don't know that we call the socialized men in that same way of sitting with a person to to allow them their process, you know. Well, I am I am uh, as a as a man who was raised by a woman um, exclusively, um, as a man who continues to be raised by his daughters, um, shaped by them. Um, I am. I bristle at any kind of, you know, men are this and women are this. So I, I will respectfully reject that. Um, but what I will say <laughs> um, I is, I love is the, that when you, whatever your archetype is, um, when you engage in this situation, and I'm saying I work with provider networks and payer networks, we have um, oncology solutions around behavioral health and so on and so forth. And I, <clears throat> pardon me, I didn't have a clue. I sincerely, this, this isn't hyperbole. When I found myself in that theater with this circumstance, I didn't know what to do. And, and I have, I'm blessed with resources and relationships and all of these things. And it wasn't lost on me that if I didn't know what to do, heaven help others. And uh, heaven so, help others. Heaven yes. help others. Heaven help others. You're right. You're right. You're right. All right. So what's your number two? I don't know if we did that one. What's your number yeah, we did two. two. So so uh, one was uh, be present. Two communication. Three was have a plan. Our name is Jamie. I will be assisting. And uh, so that have a plan um, is to understand the appointment schedule. Uh, confirm that you understand your role um, in the caregiving pre post op uh, process. Um, I found it important to have an internal safe word um, that wasn't an expletive um, because I would hear some things and I, you know, the black man in me would be like, what? You know, <laughs> you know, and so I needed to have, because again, and not even not verbalizing, but internally understand that she's not talking to me. And I actually, I was going to talk a little bit about this in the in homie, am I crazy, but I'll, I'll bring it up on the have a plan. We told the, that she had a lumpectomy, the, the night of the surgery, we, we said she cannot take this particular drug. It had a psychotropic uh, effect on her. Um, and that was really bad. I mean, like really, really bad. Like she became somebody else. So we could not have been more clear that this particular drug you cannot take, you cannot give her. And they gave her that drug. So when she came home, you know, I, you know, I, th if, if people are old enough to know who uh, is it, Linda Blair and the exorcist, it, it is, it was, I, you know, was a prisoner in my house that night, uh, you know, and it was, it was bad. And I didn't really have a plan other than there was in, in the Twin Cities, I live in Texas now, but I was in Minnesota at the time. There's a sister, Doc, who I, I'm literally in the bathroom with the door locked, calling her saying, this could be bad. What should I, you know, what's going on here? So she said, you know, call the hospital, find out that, 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 that. But part, this idea around having a plan, um, at the very least, what happens 
a lot of times the plans didn't, you know, they didn't work uh, because she was tired or something else happened or those kind of things. But the availability of a plan at least communicated to her that I had contemplated where we were, what was going on, what my role was or was not to be. She blessed the plan. Um, she initiated, you know, my role in the plan. But having that in a way that was contemplative and 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 really was serious, it 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 really smoothed over, particularly in the in the in the very uh, beginning, um, a, a really rough patch. Um, candidly, and you know, this person that I'm referencing, I'm actually not involved with anymore, and I really believe that not having a plan initially created these kind of imperceptible cracks that manifest themselves even post um, cancer. So I, you know, so it was one of these things where it, it was, uh, it, it, it became a saving grace that night when, when, when the, the sister was telling me, uh, you know, okay, Ricardo, you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to do this. And then I was like, okay, there's something I can do. I can throw myself in the, cause I'm a planner, you know, I am going here and plan these things. And, you know, 50% of the time it worked and, and, and sometimes it didn't. Yeah, you can't plan cancer, unfortunately. Right. You can't plan. You never know how you're going to feel. And you can't, you know, and I'm not a planner. I'm a really spontaneous person. And it still wrecked my nerves because I just felt always out of control. I felt like I had no control over my body. I, you know, when I was on chemo, I felt like I had no control over my body. I never knew what was going to happen in the next hour, in the next few minutes, in the next day. So you couldn't even make a plan like I'm going to go to the grocery store tomorrow. You couldn't make a plan like I'm going to do this at four o'clock. There was no concept for that because you just have no idea how you're going to feel. And so even the thought of thinking about a plan is is like mind boggling because it just automatically frustrates you because you really just don't have a concept for your own reality in any way possible. I can't describe it any better. I mean, Mo, I don't know, like the well, chemo just takes you for out. normalcy, like meals, right? Like you might, you might have yeah. you know, activate the whole meal chain and everything and be providing for, you know, the family, the kids or whatever, but that person who's experiencing it may not be able to tolerate those foods. They may not have an appetite. They may not. So you have to really be able to pivot, I think, and, and, and be resilient, even in your, your making and having a plan you know, that ability to have some flexibility there. So you don't end up frustrated because the thing you plan doesn't necessarily go the way you planned it. But I think, you know, the, for, for me, I was very moved and touched by the anticipatory uh, nature of this planning, right? You've already thought about, okay, what do I need to do for home? And you've right, approached it right. with that person. That's so you, you're not, you're, you're, from right? You're, you're like, okay, this is what I'm thinking. Here's what I think I can do and what I can bring. How does that feel to you? And that sort of cooperative discussion, I think, is what's missing from so many of the best laid plans that end up taking a left turn and that really do, as you say, you know, create some chinks in the armor of the intimacy um, and, and, and erode some aspects of, of the relationship because somebody feels put down, somebody feels shut out, somebody feels whatever because things had to pivot, you know? Mo, I couldn't, I couldn't have said that any better. Uh, that, that is exactly right. I think the other thing that was important, if I can double down on what you just said, is that the plan is the plan. It's not me. You know, I, the plan's being rejected. I'm not being rejected, you know, you know, so I, I completely agree with that. That's exactly right. And you, you referenced um, intimacy. Um, that is, that's number four, um, which is idea of providing opportunity for intimacy. Um, and my daughters are listening. And in fact, Ricky, uh, you know one of my daughters, Camille Johnson, Cam Johnson. Oh, Camille, uh, you're kidding. Is my oh, wow. second oldest daughter. Oh, wow. Yes. I, oh, wow. Yes. How are you, Camille? Yeah, so, so she's she's you. listening. And, oh, uh, wow. Hey, Camille. That's so yeah. wild, right? Isn't that amazing? Oh, it is. It is a, it's a small, small world. world. You know, the Shivana, actually, Camille introduced me to Shivana. So, oh, wow. Um, that's so yeah. crazy. But so the, crazy. Uh, the, so then recognizing that they're listening, what I will say is, is that what I tried to do, um, is on a very, on a regular basis, remind her that I found her beautiful, um, that I found what we were experiencing um, an opportunity to bring us closer together. That, and and I, I vehemently felt that. I, 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 you know, at the core of who I was, I felt like it was us 
um, against the world, against this disease, and that, and but I had to manage that in a way that didn't begin to overstep the responsibilities that that she had for her care journey uh, and the role I played in that. But all the way up to that line to say that for whatever it is you need me to be or need me where you where you need me to be, I'm here. Um, and so it was one of these things where as we're going through this, um, it was it was special to be able to create intimacy. And again, this was an, a new relationship. So, you know, the the kind of fun new relationships would traditionally have. Um, were put on hold for a while. And in doing so, I think it began to evolve the the depth. And you know, that person and I are still very good friends. In fact, she might be watching right now. Um, the the idea of the what was unique about our relationship was it was born from the soil of that, of that experience. Um, and that and in those ways, those roots are never severed. So it, it was really that was special. It was kind of new for me, you know, the to, to be intimate like that. Um, and, and you know, there is um, all of these ways. And, you know, I learned how to brush hair and, and understand what the the medicine was having, you know, the effect it had on hair and all kinds of, there was just lots of things on, you know, we, there was some lotion that came from France from a friend of ours. And so uh, applying that, all of these things were these real unique and special ways for the two of us to remain intimate, even when the, you know, what would be a traditional sense of intimacy, you know, wasn't always, um, um, you know, there wasn't an opportunity for, you know, based on what was going on for that. So that that was uh, that was the other lit, the other thing that I would have told myself is to continue to look for as many opportunities of intimacy as possible. OK, so I got through that without embarrassing my daughter, I think. No, <laughs> so, no, it, it's that. great because intimacy is so much more than uh, than the act of intercourse. Amen. And, and it's a it's a tough thing for people to wrap their minds around when I say, OK, it's important for you to remain intimate during this time. You know, I'm your breast surgeon and I'm talking to you about your surgery and your scars and your this. And I say, OK, it's important for you to remain intimate, you know, and, and I, I talk about well, what does that mean? It means that your erogenous zone might not be here, but we have to find some other areas of good touch. What feels relaxing to you? What, you know, what feels sensuous to you or what just feels tolerable to you that you can continue to engage with your partner? Maybe it's a foot massage, lower back, maybe it's shoulders, right? Or maybe it is scar massage or something more, uh, you, you know, more personal after surgery, but kind of staying connected in whatever way you can is the, the biggest probably part of the sexual intimacy. It's the emotional intimacy and the vulnerability you're on you're on mute ricky go ahead yeah yeah i would say it's some um, the intimacy is emotional there, it is, there's nothing that's sexual about it it's about understanding me being connected to me and understanding what i'm going through and hearing me i think and that was more important than you know i actually when i was on chemo i was afraid to have sex because i was afraid of like getting bacteria in my body right <laughs> like from any from any source if i can't eat lettuce I shouldn't be having sex. So I don't mean, I don't know, my doctor never really told me that, but I, uh, but I was afraid for t to have any germs near in any capacity. You know what I mean? So intimacy was more about, it was totally a mind game. Like, are you with me with this or not? You know? Um, and my husband wasn't. So I don't even know what it would be like to go through breast cancer with male support. Cause I didn't have it when I was sick. You know what I mean? So um, I don't know. I think it's it's a gift to me if if it's if it's um if you can provide a support system that that um in any capacity is a gift when you're going through that horrible thing. And you know, it never really goes away. And I think even now I'm still 12 years out and um and intimacy still is very much a mind thing before it's physical because of the experience I had, you know. It's funny too, I ask a lot of breasties when that are dating, at what point do you tell the man you're dating that you have breast cancer or that you have no boobs or that you had breast surgery, you know? And I think everybody does it differently. Like to me, it was like, as whoever, as soon as I meet you, well, you know, I had breast cancer, <laughs> but maybe it's because of my life, it's my life and it's my life's work. But 
I mean, a lot of women don't talk about it. They hide it for a few days. They don't want to bring it up, you know, so, but it's definitely a subject to deal with in terms of like, at what point do you feel safe enough to have this conversation that, that something different about your body that you may not have reconciled with yourself, you know? So leaving room for intimacy and, and allowing it to take on different forms, right? That is, I think, a really big part of it. And, and even after the treatment is over, finding what that may look like and feel like for you, potentially for the first time, right? Because I yep, think that yep. so much of our definitions of intimacy are tied to intercourse and tied to, you know, sort of who finishes and when and how that all plays out. You know, we have these really kind of maybe strange ideas about or, or pre predefined preconceived notions maybe, but, but after a diagnosis, it, it gives you the opportunity to have some conversations that you didn't think you'd be having and, and exploring intimacy in a lot of different ways, you know, and, and I, I, I tell patients to really just take it slow and set small expectations, right? Don't go thinking, okay, it's date night and we haven't had anything and done anything in six months. And now we're going to you know, the sparks are going to fly here, right? Like you, you just have to set really reasonable goals and, and then crush them slowly but surely, right? Can we just kiss and make out for 10 minutes without pain? Ouch, oops, you know, guilt, uh, you know, something fumbling and, and whatever. And just start there and then give yourself like five good tries because that way, if you botch the first one, nobody feels guilty, nobody feels put down. It's like, all right, well, we still got four more tries. When are we doing this again? And it's us against this thing. Like you said, Ricardo, like that's a really... Um, a wonderful, I think, philosophy and approach. And, and, and I, I, I feel like patients may start out that way, but something happens and it doesn't always end up that way. It ends up with a lot of other emotions in the room. Um, you're number five though. We got to get to it. I was, uh, have a, am I crazy homie? You know, All right. yeah. Ooh, just, just somebody pick up the phone and go because you know, listen, in, the, in, in this particular instance, this wasn't my wife. Um, you know, I, you know, we were dating and, um, and then, you know, we were talking about getting married and these other things. And I remember to the point um, before I thought, you know, wait a minute, I'm going to spend my life with this woman. Um, and then the prospect that that was going to be a short lived life. I remember sitting in the lobby and, you know, negotiating with God, because this is what I do every day is negotiate. And I just said, you know, God, don't let her die. So you really loved her. I mean, she was a, yeah. she was a short relationship, yeah, but you were in love you. with her. Yeah. It, it was it was a long relationship. It was five years, so it was a long relationship. But I didn't want her to die, yeah. and uh, and so even the the locking myself in the bathroom, um, you know, I uh, I kept reminding myself, well, you know, you said you could handle anything that she didn't die, <laughs> so this this is it. But then week days become weeks, and weeks become months. And you kind of get into this rhythm of, well, you know, she's going to live and, you know, these other kind of things. And then, you know, you know, you start being an, you know, being me. And I, I don't want to say a guy because I'm not like anybody and nobody's like me, but um, I start being me, which is, you know, I want to be special. I want my time. I want this. I, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm tired. You know, I've had a bad day. I've got kids I have to take care of and businesses I have to run. Where's my woman? You know, that kind of thing. And to be able to call somebody and say, she's there. She's just not there now. And if you are going to be who you say you are, then you have to understand that you got to dust yourself off and get on back out there. It doesn't matter whether you're sane or you're crazy. This is what it is. Mm. And if this and what it is, is I was just this morning, somebody was talking about, you know, about, uh, and I, I, it was, it, I, I didn't think I would be using it today or for this call, but they were talking about sprinting here. I, I, I'll read it. Um, somebody asking, are you willing to sprint when the distance is unknown? Um, are you willing to give it all every day and trust that God will refill your tank to do it again the next day? And so we were talking about this this morning and I was saying, you know, that, 
if you honestly, if you told me what it meant to raise my kids um, at 57 years of age, um, when I was at 25, I honestly don't know that I would have kids. I mean that. I mean mm. that. They, they've given me great love. But the most pain I've experienced in my life is at the hands of my children. And, and so what I would say is, you know, if I went back and I, and, and I said at 25, well, you know, you're going to have a child. And I knew everything. I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> Life's pretty good. It's pretty simple right now. And, and the, um, but what I tell myself is that I just need the grace for today. I just need to be a good dad today. I need to be a good person. You know, my daily bread is really the only thing I need. And when I'm talking to my homie and saying, I'm like, he says to me, or she says to me, can you get through today? And if you can get through today, that's really the only thing you need to be able to do. Uh, it just doesn't matter whether you're crazy or not, or whether you're right or whether you're wrong. The enormity of this opportunity requires you to be present, to communicate, to have a plan, to provide opportunity for intimacy. And then if you are crazy or you're not, all of those things will manifest a solution um, that will give you the ability to get to the next day. Hmm. That's that's pretty powerful, I have to say. And it sounds also like you were able to find either like-minded or synergistic folks who can offer that sort of balanced approach. Because, you know, we all have our choir of people who are like, you know what, you're right, it is about you. And and the, the yes people who co-sign, you know, we 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 got some co-signers in our in our community. But yes. finding who can who can give you that balanced perspective and, and, and hold you accountable. Um, that, that sounds like really, really special friends. And, and I guess my question is, how do people, how, how do people find that? You know, if you don't already have it, is there, were there resources that you were aware of? Did you become aware of them? Or are these just organic friends and folks that you knew and they had your back? So, you know, I'm Greek. So I have some fraternity brothers. I'm a Kappa. Um, I am a Christian. Um, so I have a, a faith community. Um, um, I am a, a, a health professional. So, you know, we had, I had, I was in, you know, I was lucky. I mean, we could go to Naples in the weekend and, you know, I, it was obvious to me that not everybody could, it was funny because you'd see social media and people like, man, you guys are living your best life. And I'm like, no, we're not. <laughs> it's not no, no, we're fighting in Naples. <laughs> you know, we're fighting, you know, no, we're not. We're not living our, it looks good, but no, it, because the, the, the challenges that we were going through were not about what was going on externally. It was about what was going on internally. And, um, but, you know, I was really blessed to be in that relationship. Um, I was really blessed to have, um, as much as my children are challenged to have them, they really stepped up. Um, and we're, we're very loving and in fact, still good friends, um, with her now. Um, I think all of those, that is the thing. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it is a horrible disease. Um, it, you know, cancer has touched my family, has shaped my family, the direction of our family and the resources we have and all of those things. My mom is living with stage four cancer now. Um, there, there are lots of things that are going on that the cancer have in, has impacted. Um, and so there's nothing about cancer that's great, um, except your ability to survive it. And, and so post cancer, what I began to be able to do is go, yeah, this is bad, but it wasn't that, <laughs> you know, it was, you know, this is tough, but you know, here we are today, you know, the, these kind of things. And it really gave me perspective on mortality. Um, it gave me perspective on capacity. You know, these were the things that that I came away from enriched from really one of the darkest periods of my life. Wow. So can I ask what really broke you up? No. You don't have to answer. No, I, I'm not going to answer that. Okay. Okay. So my but cancer, cancer was the a, a huge piece of of everything you had in your relationship. I mean, but it, it consumes your whole life. It consumes yes. every piece of you. It consumes every part of your being. So, 
there's no way you can like put it in a box and get rid of it or move it out of the way. You can't, it's there, it's ever present. And you know what? It's always ever present. It doesn't go away. Like it's always a piece of me. It's always here every day. You know what I mean? And um, I think sometimes, you know, even as a survivor, I want to get rid of it. But then I have survivor guilt because one of my breasties dies or gets worse than me. And so it never goes away. It's a, it's like a part of your being forever. I mean, I don't know, Mo. I don't know how to express it any differently. I, I think that's fair. I mean, I guess I could say the same from a different side of the coin, right? Like it, it, it literally is always there. I remember once I went to a movie theater, I was just, I was all cancered out and I was like, I'm just going to go watch a movie this weekend. And I went to the movies and all of the pre-movie commercials were about cancer in the workplace. And then the movie itself was about, it was, I think it was 80 for Brady. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to see some old ladies watching, you know, Brady. Yeah. And, oh, it's about cancer. <laughs> you know what? You, you can't get away from it. Um, and, and I suppose that, you know, we learn how to find joy despite, right, what, what we see and what we're involved in and what we're trying to help others through. And, and my question for you, Ricardo, is, is, is that, you know, despite cancer being a present for uh, a, a presence in your, in your life, what brings you joy? Well, I, what I will say is, is that you know, the one thing about darkness is that it amplifies light, you know, and so you really in that moment, you really can see uh, people like you, Mo. I, you know, I, my my oldest daughter, who's probably watching too, she had asthma and she was in the hospital 30 or 40 times. And so we would go to the ER and I had this after about the 10th time, I had this kind of canned speech, but it was given like it was being said extemporaneously. And that was, I know you see people all the day, all day, but in all the people that have ever been made, this is the only one made like this. Yeah. And so you're going to take care of her. You're mm -hmm. going to take care of her. And what I, I, what I say is we're in there and we're meeting with these doctors and, you know, I work with provider networks and I understand the levels of depression and burnout and, you, you know, dealing with insurance and payment and all these other kind of things. And so I see people like you, Monique, and what I will say is even in the midst of those challenges, you are inspiring. And we, the grace there, the, the kindness, the gentleness of the people inside of that. And, you know, having had this experience with asthma, where it's kind of this kind of, you know, and I'm like, oh, no, you're going to slow down, you yeah. know, but to then to be able to have these, these angels working inside the, the breast cancer center, um, it was extraordinary. It, it was, you almost wanted to speak in, in quieter tones because there was a reverence of the work that was being done there of the character of the people committed to uh, battling this disease. Um, those moments weren't lost on me. Um, and I will say too, uh, not a small amount of there, but for the grace of God go I. I was healthy, you know, I was healthy. And so, you know, and I, there's there's a little bit of that, you know, man, I, I'm dying that you're sick. And thank God I'm healthy, you know, and that to, to deal with the the guilt of that, you know, where you want to whisper that in your mind is just, like, oh, no, I, I don't know. I'm not thinking that. Yeah, I'm thinking that I'm man. I, you know, you know, 90 days into this thing, this woman might be gone 90 days from now or this and the other. And what does that mean to you? How, you know, we're mortal. Really? We, we die, <laughs> you know, and so all of these lessons that were being learned there. And again, I want to just say, if I haven't said, um, I was party to an extraordinary woman working, parenting, being a daughter, uh, being God help her, my significant other. Um, if she is watching, you know, big ups to you. I love you for that and for a bunch of other things. Um, and so I, I just wanted, you know, you know, writing all these things to somebody that I'm no longer seeing is surreal, 
Um, you know, uh, but, you know, and candidly, cancer doesn't make you a saint. Um, it, it doesn't, you know, the, and it doesn't make you perfect for everyone. It doesn't make you terrible for everyone. You still have these same challenges. Um, and in fact, maybe it created, you know, this kind of false reality post. But what I, you know, and again, I don't want to get in it because it's not just my business. It's, it's also her business. But what, what I will say is um, that when we went through this process, for me as a health professional, you know, sitting in chemo with my mom, um, other members of my family going through these procedures, when I'm sitting in a boardroom talking about um, uh, insurance, talking about uh, provider criteria, talking about these kinds of things, I'm a pretty intense guy anyway, uh, but I, it is ratcheted up since my experience and I am talking with a degree of empathy to the extent that I can be empathetic, having not gone through the process, um, that I try to channel what those individuals have had to deal with, the people that were like me, or the, the people that are like my mother or my grandmother, um, and to be able to say, you know, we, there's going to be a voice for those individuals in this room today. And you're going to not just listen to me, but you're going to hear it, and that a lesson is going to manifest in policy. Um, mm -hmm. And so all of these experiences, I believe, um, you really matter. I don't know, Mo, how you do what you do. I, I don't, you know, I, you know, yeah, presumably. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing how she does what she does. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, it's a day, gift, after day after day. Gift. That's, that's tough. It, it's amazing. It's a gift. You know, but what I heard you say and what I think is really important for people who are watching who our caregivers and supporters and ecosystem is that when you go into spaces and you advocate, you take it from, you know, virtual and 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 the stories of the narrative and the lived experience to visceral, right? It becomes real in you and you invite other people to tap into that too. And that's what I think changes policy. And yeah. it's why the the lived experience of the survivors are so important in advocacy spaces and in legislative spaces and all the spaces where like where Ricky's organization where touch brings people because it, it it's hard to change policy when you don't understand how it truly impacts people. Um, well, and if I could just add to that, yeah, it's it. hard to change policy when you believe that your experience is ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and that's what I see more than anything else. It is not a room full of people who don't care. It's a room of people who don't know and don't yeah. care to know. They, they think that, that their experience is Ricky's experience. And that, that how healthcare has treated them, treated Ricky or treated my mother or my grandmother. My grandmother died of a completely manageable disease. And, and so, well, why, well, this is what I do. And, and to be now in a place professionally when I can now look at them and say, but you're not them. You, you haven't had their experiences. They haven't had your experiences. So I just want to just double down on that. that it, I, I try to say to people all the time, insurance companies aren't, you know, you know, these maniacal, you know, around a cauldron laughing. If you're healthy, you're less expensive to them. Mm -hmm. So, there, you know, even if there is no altruism, which there absolutely is, but even if there wasn't, it's bad business. And so, mm -hmm. you know, but the idea is, is that there's no curiosity. That's what I will say. There's arrogance and there's there's very little curiosity. And then when you or Ricky begin talking, it's like your story is a unicorn. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't know that this was true for you. No, yeah. this is for a community of people that you have fallen through the gap that you created in your lack of curiosity and ignorance. So a tone that's deafness. my day-to-day -day conversations. Oh, you're right. It is. There's a tone deafness that says, oh, that, oh, that must be other people in such and such a group, but not the general population, not that's the right. sum total of folks, and not right. recognizing that it is a more common experience. And I'm talking about implicit bias in particular, exactly. right? Because your healthcare experience sounds a lot different than some of the other folks that we talk to where, you know, they don't necessarily have the, the, the care of cares and, and they walk into a place and they don't feel seen and they don't feel heard and they whisper for a different reason, maybe, because they don't feel like they have a voice and, and, and having someone with them, the blessing of having a co-survivor with you, I think is that 
it enables you to not allow yourself to disappear, you know? And so just your being present, yeah, just yeah. being in the room guarantees that doctor's going to spend at least an additional minute or two in that room. The studies show that when you bring somebody with you, right? There's a longer engagement. One or two questions more might get answered. Some things can get clarified and somebody's jotting down notes and they know what to follow up on. It isn't always the case, um, but but that presence matters. And, and you know, I, I, to, to your point though about, you know, the tone deafness of, of like insurance companies and others, this is why we do what we do. This is exactly why, you know, we, we pound yeah, the table. for sure. Should, go to these companies why you know we we this is why ricky invented invented uh you did you did invent touch i guess <laughs> I, I guess so yeah but this is why so we can have these conversations and and bring our concerns and issues to the forefront you know mm-hmm. yeah so so would you say and, and this is a sweeping generalization but would you say in some ways that cancer maybe made you a better partner a better husband a better human being did it give you did it give you any gifts or did it take well yeah it did it did give me lots of gifts um i i don't know if it would be for me to say um you know if i was better or not um but what i can say is i had a greater understanding of gratitude um my significant other and my mother got cancer uh um diagnoses weeks apart from each other um, and so, um, you know, what I was, you know, I, unfortunately for my significant other, it was a, it was a, uh, test run for how to, uh, interact with my mom and my mom, uh, is an extraordinary black woman. She is, you know, she graduated from high school when she was 16, graduated from college when she was 19. Um, she's been a Dean, she was a Dean of a college and, a secretary um, or a commissioner for a state for um, she's done just extraordinary things in her life. So telling her what to do is not easy. <laughs> you know, it is not easy. And so having been in that experience with my significant other, you know, understanding these different things and then being able to have those experiences uh, given the relationship between a, 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 a parent and their child. And then that parent getting older, um, my father has not been involved in, in our, in our lives. And so I began right. to act as become the patriarch of the family for this, you know, universe of wisdom and strength in my mother. Um, it was, it is something that I'm still, I have to kind of tap dance around because she's nothing nice if you get on her nerves. So you know, I, you know, so even now I, when I say things, it's always kind of, you know, okay, mom, you know, you know, that kind of thing to say, I, I see who you are. I recognize who you are. Have you considered this? <laughs> you know? It's a suggestion and, and, instead of a, instead of a direct, a direct, right? right. That's right. It's an open it. probe. Well, well I, I have the same thing with my mother too, man. Don't tell them what to do. And, that's the worst thing you can do. They're going to do the opposite, right? I know. My mom is 90. So with these powerhouse Black women that came before us are serious. Yes. So Ricardo, what if you had to do it again? Or what advice would you give to men who could be in this situation right now? Like having lived through it, having had this conversation, like I know you're five things, but like, would you, what would you say to them? And I think I love what you said about gratitude. And I don't know how does that how does sort of changed how we even think about things. What I'll say, Ricky, is that the the thing that I will say that I believe this experience. I, this is someone I still love, and I think she still loves me. We're just not right for each other. Um, but what I will say, um, and and I will I'll, I'll answer both of those uh, questions, Tony, um, is that what it does is it makes you part of a firmament and it makes her part of a firmament that so many things are transitory. Um, they're, in, they, they, they are, they're not, they don't last forever. Um, there was, that was a season and that season is gone. No, this kind of thing, it stays with you forever. And so it was an honor to be a part of that. And it makes you grow up. Um, even in my early fifties, you know, I had a lot of growing up to do. I still have a lot of growing up to do. 
And what that experience did was it forced me not to rely on the privileges that were afforded me by, you know, my mom making me go to college and uh, being able to get me internships, what got me on a career path that made me have resources that other people wouldn't. All of these things kind of hide um, a lack of maturity, particularly in men. I, I, there I'll make a, a the, the, the misogyny in the workplace gives you the ability to kind of get away with things that, you know, that I, that I know if I hadn't gone to that sports event or if I hadn't pledged this fraternity, or if I hadn't done this, I wouldn't have had access to these things. Cancer doesn't care. It, it, it doesn't care. And Cancer so, does not care. You know, the, the, the recognition that you better come correct or this is it um, made me become different, uh, made me more sober um, and more responsible, I hope, um, and, and, and doing that. So that's the one thing. And then what I do things differently. Yes. Yeah. I, I would do things differently. Uh, um, I, I want to make sure that while I said these five things, I wasn't these five things. I got mad and I, and, and I, you know, I was spent a lot of time going, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't have to be here. I'm, you know, you should be happy and da, 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 da. so I, I want to be clear that I wasn't this paragon of a partner. I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, th th this is me looking back saying, you know, you know, I wasn't always present. I wasn't always communing, communi communicating well. At the very beginning of um, her treatment. Um, I would book meetings all the way up until the last minute I had to leave. And I lived in Minnesota, so it'd be snowing. So she's waiting for me to pick her up and I'm, you know, getting in and then rushing, stuff like that. So then I had to teach myself two hours before I had to leave the office, I couldn't have meetings, you know? And, and so these were things that I, you know, you kind of, you, you, you try to, you know, you learn through the process, but there's a lot of things I would have done def differently. A lot of them, most of them, Mo, would be around grace. Um, you don't really understand. I have actually a picture of her on her last uh, uh, chemo and a picture of her on her first chemo. And it's just no joke. It's no joke. It's, you know, it's tough. And just to be able to watch it, I could not understand or or appreciate the enormity of what was going on and that, you know, she had to work every day and she had to do still, there were still these other things that had to happen. Um, and I wasn't always patient. That wasn't always evident to me. I was still very much tied into, you know, what I wanted and, you know, what options I should have or shouldn't have and look at what I'm doing and all of these other things. So the one of the things that I would say is that it wasn't about me. Um, <laughs> um, if you knew me more, you know, it's, it's probably something I should say every day too, in addition to giving me a, a daily bread. It's not about me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the uh, but yeah, so that that's something I would do differently. I, I can appreciate that. And I think giving yourself a bit of grace too, you know, is, is important because you don't know, there's no rule book, there's no playbook. And, and you have to, in order to live with yourself, I think, give yourself the grace to know that, you know, in this moment, I did what I could, or in this moment, it wasn't my shiny moment, but hopefully there's an opportunity to try again, right. And to get it right the next time. Yeah. Uh, and, and that goes for everybody because, you know, sometimes people are sick and they're disagreeable and they're miserable. Right. And, and they you know, we have to give them grace also, and they have to give themselves grace. And so I think the grace, thank, thank God, there's enough of it to go around. <laughs> Let's just say it that way. Thank God. I hope there is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, you know, my, my favorite song is, you know, I have grace over my life. And I know that, that, my cancer experience gave me grace that you know it's a blessing that you know that I survived it um but we all have to we all we all need grace we know you know we all have to think well today it's not about me you know and I think um when you're caring for someone 
it's definitely not about you. And it's really hard to go there, you know, with all with all of you, right? Well, I, I need a happy ending. Can we have I a got happy ending? A question though, because we didn't okay. talk. We talked about mental health, but we didn't talk about professional mental health. And I, I want to know if you can talk a little bit about that just briefly, because you know, whether you whether you're a spouse, a partner, uh, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or whatever, a co-survivor, can you just talk about if and how uh, therapy played a role in your interactions and maybe if it could have or should have? So what I will say is, and you know, part of what Muse Health does, and you know, I'm I'm always uh, I'm careful in these uh, these arenas not to do commercials, but one of the things that Muse does is is it creates um, solutions for those individuals in the gap. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, as I said, I don't know Mo how you do what you do, but. While I say that you're not a unicorn and there's lots of talented, there's not disproportionately not enough. Um, so what we've been able to do is um, identify listening cohorts um, with a uh, organization called Kindly Human. Um, it is extremely diverse. Um, it is uh, based on geographics, on faith, on demographics, on this, any other, where you can pick up the phone and just call someone who's had a, a similar experience. So they can do a, they, they do a quick little um, uh, video and then you listen to it and, and then you can call them anonymously or you can, you know, have ongoing conversations. I was fortunate, Mo, in that, you know, I had surgeons that I could call and I had, I mean, I was, you know, I recognized that our experience um, was unique um, and, and, you know, just unbelievably blessed um, you know, when my mom um, got her diagnosis, um, her plan, and I won't say the plan's name because they're a client, <laughs> um, but um, their plan didn't cover where she wanted her treatment. Um, and I was able to have the president of the plan called to get it, uh, get the formulary added. Uh, and um, that's not a flex. It is, it is a, a, a reflection, candidly, of not having advocacy, what would have happened? Um, and so when I'm out here, and I will tell you, Mo, I act a fool in these places. You know, they, uh, I, I have a little. They call me Maximus. This is the sword Good. here. Oh, so I. Bring him on. That's right. <laughs> bring the machete. I love it. Bring so, the hammer. Yeah, I act a fool in there um, because I recognize not everybody can pick up the phone. And then what I want people to understand is that they, you know that just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And when you look at the cost that health literacy is having on health systems, um, now they can't ignore it anymore. And then when you marry on one side of the ledger, and then when you marry uh, the health equity scores, and we actually have meetings with CMS um, to uh, get advice from them on initiatives that we're doing inside of these networks, of being able to get real um, detailed advice on initiatives to increase the health equity scores. The These two... Um, realities, I think, are moving us close to being able to offer what you were saying, behavioral health. There is a federal guideline that requires parity for health and behavioral health. Um, unfortunately, health systems are just, they're way behind. And e just being able to do it at all is not even a function of money. It is, it is a function of not having enough health professionals, not understanding communities, all of these types of things. And so, you know, our days are full, um, they're blessed, but the ability to seek, and I would even say demand um, adequate behavioral health during this process for everyone in the system um, is absolutely critical. It is absolutely critical because if, you know, if we're not good here, nothing else really is, can be optimal. And so I, I just, I, I thank you for bringing that up. It is an obsession of mine. It's actually one of the reasons why I live in Texas. The, the, the behavioral health company is based here. Um, and I think it is the most effective way. These, these listening cohorts, these communities, um, anything that has existed for time immemorial um, is the thing that we should be focusing on. Well, 
evil has existed for time immemorial, anything good that has existed for time immemorial um, that has worked well, the ability to call someone and say, tell me your experience. This is my experience. How did you handle this? It gives advice and it also provides uh, some hope that they were able to make it. So I, maybe I can do it too. There's your, there's your good news, Ricky. There's your good news. There's note. my good news. There's my happy ending. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh my gosh, Ricardo. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm honored. Thank you. Lots of words of wisdom and um, love to all the women in your life. Thank you. Yeah, and, I will. I will. I, I have Camille and Brianna. They're all texting me right now. So right, okay, well, Leo, it's either Daddy, Camille shut up, get off the line, or good job. I'll tell you. I'll find out in a minute. So. <laughs> but no, thanks for joining us. You know, it's great to hit to have you know a male perspective of someone who's actually been through this and thought about it. You know, and we'll do more. We you know we have couples on a lot, but um, not a lot, but every now and then. And um, but I think it's something we have to talk about more about. You know, what a co-survivor a co-survivor experience is. So thank you for doing this with us during caregiving month too, you know, because it's such a important thing to talk about and get people thinking about, you know, how to do this differently or how to how to do it at all. You know, what are the what are the things to think about? Because you're usually thrown into it. You didn't really choose it. Right. It just sort of happened to you, right? We never choose it. It just happens and you're like, oh my God, WTF, what am I supposed to do now? Right. So there's no handbook, no manual, but there no is manual. hope. And hopefully the, those people who are watching who are caregivers and ecosystem and co-survivors and support um, feel supported through the programming. We hope you share yeah. it. You know, yeah. um, just a little share a link on Facebook. You can you know, go to our YouTube and you can rewatch it and you can just kind of let people know that there's resources. You should absolutely go to the website. Would you tell us your website, please? Sure, it's mymusehealth.com. Uh, um, and, you know, I, I want to thank, you know, our partners at Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, at Allstate Health, Atula Health, uh, I mentioned Kindly Human, and um, Urban MD, um, as well as Fusionetics. So these are all our partners really in the day-to-day -day fight to, to bring equitable care um, to all communities. Yeah, and awesome. thank you partners, right, for, for bringing this programming to Black Doctor, to uh, yeah. Gilead, Amgen, Gen Genentech. Dennis yeah, Yvonne. Novartis, Novartis. We thank Novartis. you all for support, and we thank you, Black Doctor, and we thank you, Ricardo, and um, we'll see you guys next week. That's it. Thank we you. Hope it's right? all reliable and real, and if you happen to be around tomorrow at one o'clock, right, you can catch Ricky and I in New York City, uh, for People versus Cancer, Atlantic Magazine, yes. the day-long symposium. And we will be talking about the crisis of breast cancer in the Black community and the challenges with clinical trials and advances in the science uh, for breast cancer treatment and survivorship for, for, for the Black community especially. So if you're around, if you want to log in, uh, it's on all of our websites, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. But People versus Cancer, um, check us out. Yeah, we'll we'll try to share it to our page, to our touch page. Okay, we'll do our best to do that. Wonderful. Thank All you right. for having me. I, I kind of feel like I crashed the, the thank ladies. Thank you. Um, uh, the, the, You're an invited guest. Uh, you, anytime, anytime. 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 Rescue love. All right. Yeah, thank you. Back to see right. us again. Thank you. There All it right. is. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Love you, Mo. I'll see you tomorrow. Safe travels. I'll see you. Okay, you too. Bye.